Hi everyone. Thank you for joining me today for some virtual vitamin Z as we are bringing the Detroit Zoo to you. My name is Claire. I'm a curator of education with the Detroit Zoological Society and today I have an epic tale of survival, literally bringing a species back from the brink of extinction that I want to share with you. So before we dive into this incredible story, we have a couple vocabulary words that I want to share with you. And it's important for our early learners, our young learners, to see these words before they hear them in context so they can build them into their everyday vocabulary. So we're going to talk about what the word extinct means. I'm going to take you to a place called Tahiti, and I'm going to show you where that is on my globe. I'm going to talk to you about a timeline, the word reproduce, and the word reintroduce. So all of those will come up in our conversation today, and I will point them out so you can help make sense of them. So what type of animal am I talking about? Well, it's a tiny snail, this big. So this is an exact replica, replica of a Parchula nodoso snail, and the Detroit Zoo was literally responsible for bringing them back from the brink of extinction. Now, you might have a hard time seeing this little guy because my camera is going to zoom in on me instead of what I'm holding up in front of it. Fortunately, I have a glamour shot for you. So you can see how charismatic and fantastic these little snails are. And back in 1989, the last 26 snails on Earth arrived at the Detroit Zoo. And that's what the number 26 looks like, just to give you a kind of conceptual understanding. So you're probably wondering, how, how did they end up at the Detroit Zoo? Why us? And why were there only 26? What happened to them? Well, to do that, first I have to take you to Tahiti. So let me pull out my globe. And we're up here in Michigan where the Detroit Zoo is. And I'm going to fly you all the way down across the Pacific Ocean to French Polynesia where Tahiti is. Just to give you a frame of reference, Hawaii is right about there. French Polynesia and Tahiti are just underneath the equator. So it's this beautiful Pacific island. And on this island is where the Parchula snails live. And now we're going to back up about 55 years to prior to 1967. And I'm going to share with you a timeline or a series of events in date order that share their story. But because they're snails, I'm going to call this a slime line, a little play on words, if you will. So here they are in 1967, living the snail's good life. So snails, Parchula snails specifically, are responsible for breaking down leaf matter. So leaves that are dead and decaying, they break that down and they turn it into the fantastic soil that we need for trees and plants and flowers to grow. So they're really important. So they're living their good life, they're doing what they need to. In 1967, the Tahitians brought over African land snails as a food source. They were never intended to get out on the island, but they did. And they started eating the Tahitian crops, um, the food that they were growing for themselves to eat. It became a really big problem. So about 10 years later, in 1977, they introduced the Florida rosy wolf snail. And this snail was brought there to eat the African land snails and save their crops. But unfortunately, they started eating the Parchula snails instead. And it didn't take long to get to the point where there was hardly any Parchula snails left. Fortunately, wildlife conservationists realized that something was going wrong and they gathered up as many of the snails as they could find and they sent them to several different organizations around the world in hopes that humans could save the species from going extinct. Now, I have my trusty ruler because this is part of the story. Parchula snails are about an inch long. That's about from my first knuckle to the tip of my finger. So they're pretty small. African land snails, the ones that were eating all the crops and all the food, eight inches. That's a big snail and it eats a lot. So now you can understand that it was a big problem. And then they brought in the rosy wolf snails to eat those land snails and they're about four inches in size. So if I was a four inch snail, I sure would rather eat a parchula snail as a little snack than try to tackle a really big African land snail. So the last 20 arrived at the Detroit Zoo and now our animal care team is tasked with making sure they don't go extinct. In order to do that, they have to provide just the right habitat, just the right conditions where they can start reproducing and having young. They need to know the right temperature, how much humidity or moisture in the air there needs to be, what they eat, how often they eat, what kind of light comes down to make them feel like they're at home. So that's what a good scientist does. You ask all these questions and you plan all these investigations so you can get the results that you're hoping to get to, which is making sure these snails survive. And I am very, very pleased to share with you we got it right. So in the last 26 years, between 1989 and 2015, the Detroit Zoo has been responsible for 
50,000 snails being born. That's incredible. And to give you an idea of what 50,000 looks like, I showed you 26. Each one of these little tiny squares has 100 dots in it. So that's 50,000. And once we had that stable population in human care, we started sending them out to different organizations around the world so they could also help build up this population of snails. Once there was a sufficient number in 2015, we decided, you know what, it's time. Let's try and reintroduce them or bring them back to Tahiti and put them back where they belong in the forest so they can continue doing that important job that they haven't been able to in some time. So we sent 100 snails to an organization in Europe who coordinated this effort. And the organization in Europe took snails from a bunch of different places and they flew them down to Tahiti and they released them. And then they monitored them very, very carefully to see how many were dispersing, how many were moving up into the trees, how many were surviving. And they took tons and tons of notes. They had some pretty good successes and they had some other areas that weren't as successful for the reintroduction. So the next year in 2016, they took more snails back out to Tahiti and we sent 60 individuals for that release. And that one went really well. They had asked all those important questions that scientists did, do, like what type of tree, what time of day, how many snails in each place, all those great scientist questions. And I have a couple photos from that release. You can see the parchula snails starting to crawl out of their container right here that's been put on the tree. And here's one that's come out of the, um, the container and now he's out and about on a leaf. So to celebrate this amazing story and the Detroit Zoo's role in it, we actually made an entire exhibit dedicated just to Parchula nodoso snails. And if you visit the Detroit Zoo, if you go into the Wildlife Interpretive Gallery, which is one of the first buildings you see when you walk in, it's been there since 1928 when the zoo opened, and it's a whole building now that's dedicated to exploring the relationship between human and non-human animals and how that continues to evolve. So I'm gonna give you a quick tour um, right up here we have a video that's on loop that talks about the stories of the Parchula and then we have our slime line or our timeline of events in the back. We have a live feed that goes into the Parchula habitat and that's because they have such specific requirements to be thriving and surviving or sur surviving and thriving um, that we can't put people nose to nose to them but we can give you a glimpse into their habitat and see what they're up to on a daily basis. We have an awesome log on the bottom that has those exact replica Parchula snails on it so you can get up close and personal. And I'll talk about this guy in just a minute. But the exhibit's name is Shell Isle. And you can see on the back, we represented their reintroduction into Tahiti by putting a container that looks just like the one they used in the release on that back wall with some snails crawling out of it. And if you look really close, you can see that there's a little tiny number painted on the back of each snail. And that's so when the researchers were releasing them, they could track where they went and how they were doing. And I read a kind of funny note in the report that said the day that they were painting them, the snails were pretty active and they kept crawling over each other and smearing each other's numbers. So <laughs> they had to only do a couple at a time. And when you're painting hundreds and hundreds of snails, that takes a minute, but it was well worth it. In the front, we have a giant replica of a Parchula snail. So you can get up close and feel how their body feels and how their shell feels and see some of those awesome charismatic aspects that make them so much fun. So I checked in with our animal care team yesterday and they sent me some pictures from the habitat. So these are less than 24 hour old pictures. And you can see some of the snails down here on the bottom and a couple living underneath this leaf. And are you ready for this? A baby snail. How fantastic is that? Um, the ballpoint pen is in there for a sense of scale as to how tiny these are when they're first when they're first out. Okay, so I talked to you about their story and how the Detroit Zoo was involved with it, and I have two different activities for you today. One is a snack, and the other one is a craft. So for your snack, while I have the supply list up, you're going to need an apple, some celery, some peanut butter or sun butter, some chocolate chips, and some pretzel sticks. And for your craft, some air dry clay, a marble, and some wire. But there's a lot of flexibility in with that, and I will share with you what that means. All right, let's do our snack first, shall we? Here we go. It's a kit, it's a, it's a snail. So right here, we have um, our celery on the bottom. That's the body. And then I put peanut butter in the top. If you don't like peanut butter, you could use sun butter, which is an alternative. Or you could even use cream cheese, pretzel antennas, chocolate chips for the eyes, and then I used an apple for my shell. You could also use an orange slice, you could use a kiwi slice, you could use a cucumber slice, lots of variations. Now, 
for the craft, and it's actually pretty nutritious too. My daughters are looking forward to eating it. For the craft, I found this online on Pinterest and I thought these are pretty cool. We could tuck these out in the garden. So I showed this picture to my two daughters for inspiration only. And we looked around the house to see what we had available to us. And I don't have any air dry clay right now, but I do have Play-Doh. So my daughter who's in preschool made this one and I told her she could use anything she wanted for the shell. So we have one eye and a heart patch for the other one. And uh, she found a nickel, which she used for the shell. So I have a little bit of a monetary investment in this one. But um, she really enjoyed making it. And my daughter, who's in first grade, also looked around the house to see what she could find. And this is hers. Again, made out of Play-Doh. It's got polka dots and a little crown and a, um, a shell that my parents brought back for her on a vacation up north at some point. And this one actually has started to accumulate some different clothing accessories. Um, so she's anxiously awaiting its arrival back upstairs so she can continue playing with him. If we had air dry clay, we could have made some and tucked them outside in the garden. And I think next time I have some clay around the house, we just might do that. So say you have some older learners around the house, or if you want to get in as an adult on the fun. This is a little snail that I have in the house, and he's actually made out of a fork. So two little tines are put down here for his body, one, two, and then two have been tucked up as tentacles, and then the handle of the fork has been wound around into a swirl to make that shell. Cannot take credit for making this. My mom knows how much I like snails, and uh, she got this for me, and he sits on my kitchen windowsill. All right. We covered a lot and I want to pull out some of the skills and concepts to make sure they're really transparent. So today we talked about an investigation. All those question asking that our scientists did to make sure that they were doing the best possible for those snails. So when kids are asking questions, and I have two young kids so I know how prolific the amount of questions can be, encourage that as much as you can. That natural curiosity is what makes a great scientist. We use the timeline to tell the sequence of events in a chronological order. Um, those are really important skills to be able to relay something in the order that it happened and that's something that you can practice at mealtime. What happened today? What happened first? What happened next? Measurement, we compared the sizes of those different snails and that helped tell part of our story. Measurement is an important skill that you'll use throughout your entire life. Number sense, that's why I showed you what 26 looked like and what 50,000 looked like. Smaller numbers are easier to understand. Large numbers are kind of abstract. So being able to associate them with a concrete image helps give you a sense of number sense. We practice our fine motor skills with our craft and our snack. Those are really important for young learners who are learning how to write and building those muscles they need to do that. And for older students and for adults to continue to refine those, we use our fine motor skills in everyday life. And we touched on repurposing. Finding items around the house that we might not need for their original purpose anymore, but instead of having something end up in a landfill, we can find a new home and a new life for it. All right, so, oh, hey. Oh, yes. So the next time you see a snail out on a walk or in your garden, make sure you tell them thank you. They have a really important job. They break down leaves like this. Um, and turn it into the beautiful soil that we need for our trees and our flowers and our plants. So make sure you thank them. Oh, I wasn't going to forget that. Conservation is not a beauty contest. All animals are important. And we have a responsibility to take care of the animals in the surrounding environments. Everybody has a responsibility to do that. Thanks for reminding me though. So thanks for tuning in today. Make sure you come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. where my colleague Steven will be sharing another activity for you to do. And until then, stay safe and take care of each other.